Great. Um, hello, everybody. It's uh, 2 p.m., so we'll start the Southern Tier Mayor's uh, video conference. Uh, thank you uh, for attending, everyone. Uh, we have over 150 registrants today, so uh, we might get uh, over half that amount, and the attendee number is starting to go up now, so we'll see where that goes. Um, I'm Vern Milo, and I'll be the moderator for today, and um, um, thank you every, again, again for everybody for showing up uh, and participating. Um, uh, listening on the radio, Justin Trudeau this morning talked about how um, proud he was of the collaboration the federal government was having with the provinces and territories and how he felt it was very Canadian for um, everybody to rally together, uh, put politics aside and look after the greater good of the population. And um, so, and again, I, it speaks to Canadians and, and, and I think, uh, you know, the analogy to that is that um, we have very much the same situation I'm sure we'll hear with regards to the Niagara region and how our mayors and regional government have worked together and uh, probably not as well known as the work that's being conducted at a, a federal provincial level. Um, but um, I certainly know that each one of our mayors has been working very hard and um, I personally look forward to hearing what they've been doing and uh, what level of collaboration they've been carrying out and where that's headed. So um, thank you very much to the seven mayors that are participating today. Uh, your dedication and your efforts are truly appreciated by everybody in Niagara. Thank you very much. Um, thanks to the Southern Tier Chambers, um, Welland Pelham, uh, Niagara Falls, Fort Erie, uh, Port Coburn, Waynefleet, um, and specifically Dolores Fabiano for putting this together. Uh, as well, we have the Niagara Center Board of Trade of Thorold uh, participating and, uh, and supporting this event today. Um, uh, we also have V4 Networks, uh, who's our technical um, sponsor today. Uh, Brian LaChapelle and his company are, 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 are doing a great job um, helping us from a technical standpoint and making sure the video conference goes well. Uh, just very quickly, four announcements of things that are happening uh, with, within our Southern Tier Chambers. Um, this coming Monday, uh, May 4, uh, 7 p.m. in the evening, uh, we're having an online chat with um, Melanie Jolie, uh, who's the uh, Federal Minister of Economic Development and Official Languages, uh, specifically to talk about issues with Niagara. So uh, we have an opportunity to tap into um, um, you know, Minister Jolie's time, and um, so that might be very interesting to listen in on. Um, the Chamber's organized a Niagara gift cards. Uh, typically, a fee of $99 is now free. Uh, you can promote gift cards for your business. Um, it's a good way to promote your company as well. If you wish to purchase gift cards for your employees who are at home or whatever, it's an opportunity to do so. So uh, go on to the uh, Chamber website, and you'll see that there. Um, uh, as well, Dolores has organized a Facebook group uh, that uh, is for the chamber members and uh, it's called the South Niagara Business Exchange. You can go on there, uh, post announcements, videos, ask questions, um, and have a chat with whoever's, uh, whoever's online with you. Uh, lastly, we're organizing uh, peer advisory groups. So uh, groups of six to eight businesses um, who are non-competing, uh, we'll be getting together on a regular basis to talk about their specific issues, uh, business matters of interest, um, and, um, and so forth. So we're putting that together as a peer advisor group format, and we already have a bunch of applicants for that. So that'll be getting started probably next week or the week after at the latest. Um, so much for our announcements, and um, I, I'd like to move right into our, our format for today. Um, we have uh, three questions and um, we have seven mayors online. Uh, so a lot of resources here uh, to hear answers to these questions. And uh, we'll rotate um, uh, in, uh, in order and then reverse order and then reverse order again um, for each one of the mayors to answer, uh, to answer the questions respectively. Um, that amounts to about four minutes uh, per, per mayor per question, which is, um, which is painfully too little to really give a proper explanation. I, I thank all the mayors for their, for their understanding of this. I'll try to give a five minute notification if you're a minute over and uh, we'll see how we go with that. Um, lastly, for those that are on, uh, you'll see that um, there's a Q&A uh, icon, uh, probably about the middle bottom of your screen. 
If you wish to ask a question, post it there. And, um, and, uh, and we'll uh, be watching out for those. If we have time at the end, we'll answer those Q&As. If we don't, and there's a Q&A uh, posted to a specific mayor, we'll pass it on to them and we'll try to get the answer back to you. If it's a generic one, we'll also solicit the mayors to see if they can provide an answer and then we'll uh, provide it back to you as well. Um, so on the top right corner, um, there's a gallery view and a speaker view. You can play with your screen and see which one you like. That's uh, your option as well. And, um, and this is also being recorded. So um, if um, you wish to watch it at a later time or watch it again uh, at a later time, uh, please do so. It'll be posted on, um, on your respective chamber uh, website. Um, so uh, with no further ado, let's get started. And uh, we'll get into the first question. And uh, we'll ask that to, um, oh, let me introduce the mayors, by the way. Uh, sorry about that, I didn't do that. Uh, we have um, um, uh, Niagara Falls um, uh, Mayor uh, Jim Diodati. Um, we have Wayne Fleet, uh, Kevin Gibson. Uh, we have Port Coburn, Bill Steele. Uh, we have Pelham, Marv Junkin. Uh, Fort Erie, Wayne Redekop. Welland, Frank Campion and Thorold uh, Terry Ugolini. Thank you all. Uh, first question, and we'll uh, start with uh, Mayor Ugolini with uh, the answer and, um, and move on from there. Uh, here it goes. Um, are there any specific initiatives, resources that your municipality uh, has available to assist businesses through this crisis? Uh, so we'll start with Terry, go ahead. Thank you, and I want to thank the Southern Tier Chambers for putting this event together today. Um, we've done some things. Uh, I'll go over some of the stuff. We uh, waiving a late fees and penalties uh, through June 30th. There's uh, to help uh, residents and businesses. Uh, no penalty on water sewer bills. No penalty on current year taxes. No uh, NSF fees for return payments. No interest on accounts receivable invoices and no shut off water services for non-payment during this period. As well, all 12 municipalities in conjunction with the region have formed the Niagara Economic Rapid Response Team, and uh, which will ensure that all local businesses receive timely responsive support. We'll act as a conduit for all information and support programs that are currently available and will become available from the federal and provincial levels of government. Personally, I'm spending a lot of my time dealing uh, with businesses one-on-one -on -one, and I get a lot of phone calls. And uh, what I try and do is give them as much support as I can and put them in the right uh, programs that are available, mostly at this point in time at the federal level. And in the meantime, we are currently doing our final interviews to hire an economic development manager. That's a position that we were going to fill prior to this, but. Uh, Things got delayed, but we're going full tilt to get that position filled because we realize how important that's going to be, not only now, but coming out of COVID-19 to support our business community. Um, we're also keeping up business as usual at City Hall, especially on uh, planning building issues. Um, we're working with businesses and we're making sure that uh, any other projects will be ready to go and will be ready to issue building permits as soon as restrictions are lifted. So th those are some of the things we're doing uh, within the city to help the business community and residents as well. Uh, thank you very much, Terry. That's fantastic. Um, uh, Mayor Campion, would you care to go next? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> sure. Thanks very much. And uh, thanks for organizing this. It's a, a great way to get the message out. So we're doing uh, exactly what uh, Terry's doing down there in Thorold. Uh, he's covered up most of that stuff. I think the last person to speak won't have anything to say because we're actually working in fairly close collaboration. But a couple of things that maybe haven't been touched on, um, you know, we're continuing to provide uh, services to, you know, installation of water meters in, under, in new construction, residential construction. Um, we're looking at 
uh, helping the business community uh, by identifying and helping them identify what is an essential service, what's an essential building, uh, so that they can continue to construct. We continue to pr provide building permits, although uh, these permits can't be used until certain restrictions are lifted. Uh, and I think maybe one of the major things that we've done here, and again, you'll hear this again and again, but we're lobbying upper, level, upper levels of government on behalf of our businesses and our communities. I know Terry and um, Bill Steele and I meet with, talk to uh, Vance Badaway on a regular basis once a week. So we, we continue to push that agenda at upper levels of government so we're ready to proceed and move forward. I won't repeat some of the other things that have been said. Uh, we also are well in hydro is uh, keeping uh, you know, the um, off peak time rates uh, continuous. So that, that's a, a major savings. And, uh, you know, aside from that, we, we also initiated a round table. We did have one yesterday, just bringing some samplings of different businesses to the table in a much more similar format to this, just trying to get some ideas of what they're gonna be needing as we start to lift the COVID, COVID uh, restrictions. Uh, I'll leave it at that because uh, Terry's done a great job of explaining what's going on. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Campion. Uh, next, shall we have Mayor Redekop? Great. I was afraid I'd get to speak after Mayor Diodotti, in which case there wouldn't be anything to say. <laughs> so, so aside from the things, and, and, and Frank is quite correct, we're all working together and much of what we're doing is consistent across the region. And uh, there'll be some uh, moderate changes, I suppose. In Fort Erie, um, we have been contacting our economic development office has been contacting every business. And so they're, I think about halfway through right now, just to try to ascertain what their needs are, make sure that they're familiar with the programs that are being provided by the federal and provincial governments and uh, assisting in any way that they can. We set up a business availability map, which uh, people can log on to it's on, on our website to see which businesses are open, which ones are open with some restrictions and then which ones are closed. So that, um, uh, we've just recently put out. Uh, we have a um, web page which specifically provides support for business. And um, we've also been working in conjunction with the other municipalities on the, as Terry had mentioned, the Niagara Rapid Response Team. And we'll be working as municipalities in a region on a, an economic recovery plan so that at some point we'll be able to um, at least work in some type of um, coordinated fashion in terms of how we continue to support our businesses as we're opening, opening up slowly. The one thing that we're doing, maybe some of the other municipalities are as well, is in terms of taxes, we expect that we will be deferring our June 30th and September 30th payments by a further month to give a little bit more latitude for businesses and residents. And we'll be working closely, I'm sure, with the region um, to make sure that their levy um, is satisfied as we receive monies. I'll let, I'll let uh, Bill Steele explain that one. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mayor Redekop. Um Mayor Junction, would you care to go next, uh, Marv? No, probably uh, I'd, uh, I'd like to. So in Pelham, we, uh, as uh, these other uh, mayors are doing also in their towns, we have uh, kept the uh, planning and engineering departments uh, going full tilt. Uh, again, as soon as the uh, restrictions start to get lifted, uh, we'll have uh, any, any um, projects uh, will be ready to go, the paperwork will be done, and, and, the, and the jobs can start right after that. I personally have been contacting, uh, uh, we have a, a, grower, a greenhouse grower association in Pelham. I've been contacting the members there. I will be uh, taking their message to our MPP, Sam Osterhoff. Uh, to see uh, if they can be one of the uh, first businesses opened, perhaps uh, with the uh, garden centers. Uh, they, they could uh, begin moving product. They, they took a heck of a heck. They took quite a hit uh, over the Easter weekend. Uh, so it would be nice if they could indeed uh, still capture the spring market. Um, landscaping business in, in Pelham are very important to us. We have uh, 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 huge seniors population that need help with their yard work. So the, uh, we sat down, uh, the EOC, the fire chief bylaw guy, 
he sat down with the uh, with the landscapers in the uh, in the town. I think there were five or six major in, uh, companies, and we uh, uh, came up with standard operating procedures. And we said, okay, if you guys follow these procedures, we'll, we'll let this business uh, go, and, and and you can uh, get started on that. And uh, and the citizens were very happy uh, to see uh, the, uh, see that allowance made for them. Um, I guess the uh, uh, the other great thing that because I'm a rookie mayor that I really appreciate is the uh, every week the mayors get together uh, every Wednesday. Uh, Sandra Easton from Lincoln uh, chairs the meeting, and uh, it's just a great forum where the uh, where all of us are able to bang ideas off of each other. And, and I must say that uh, I've stolen some of the ideas uh, from that conference. Uh, from that uh, teleconference and uh, taking it back to my uh, CAO. So just uh, trying to keep up on uh, on, on, on the changing uh, economic uh, conditions that are out there and uh, and trying any, uh, the same thing with the taxes. We've let it be known that if there's anybody out there that has trouble with their tax bill, bring it, bring, uh, get a hold of our clerk and we will, uh, we will work with you. Uh, it's, it's, nothing's written in stone, and, uh, and we're more than happy to, uh, to assist anyone uh, that is having trouble. Uh, other than that, yeah, just uh, uh, the town staff uh, keeping very fluid and uh, adjusting to everything uh, uh, basically on a daily, if not weekly basis. Thank you. Thank you, Marv. That's great. Uh, Bill Steele, would you like to go next? Uh, thanks, Vernon. Thanks to all the members and the executive of the Chambers of Commerce for allowing us to be here today. Um, I'm not going to reiterate what most of the mayors have said with regards to the taxes and water bills. I think we're all on the same page as that. So uh, I think that's been said. But uh, in Port Coburn, we've developed a draft action plan, which includes a COVID-19 business recovery and support page linked to our city's website on city-related COVID activities. Uh, the page is updated on a regular basis and provides access to resources and links to support through the various levels of government. The city has partnered with the Niagara Region and other local municipal economic development departments to form the Niagara Economic Rapid Response Team. Uh, the, this team meets regularly on a weekly basis and a large number of Port Coburn businesses participated in the assessment of the initial impact. We're continuing to work as a team on the follow-up survey scheduled for May. We also have been meeting with Employment Ontario to assess and support current workforce challenges. City of Port Coburn will continue to work with our counterparts throughout the region to develop a strategy based on research, advocacy, and recovery. A resilient Port Coburn business inventory has also been developed. Uh, this is an inventory of businesses who are authorized to operate during the pandemic. It includes hours of operation and creative measures by these businesses to accommodate for the current social and physical distancing requirements. The city is currently designing a digital promotional campaign to drive business uh, or businesses located within uh, Port Colbert. The marketing campaign will see paid promotion of a dedicated page featuring businesses within the city's resilient Port Colburn business inventory. Registration is open to all Port Colburn businesses. And this is part of our current business retention and expansion program, the BRNE. And the need of marketing and promotional support was a key need identified by our local businesses within our surveys. And the other thing I want to touch on is what uh, Mayor Campion and Mary Ugolini talked about with regards to meeting uh, weekly with MP Badaway uh, right now, as well as um, staff and mayors of those two communities, as well as Auburn. Uh, we're working, putting together a list of projects. So as we come out of COVID, how Vance can approach his government with regards to relief coming back to us in uh, infrastructure funding and, and, and the like. So that's really the way we're moving. One thing I do have to say here is the fact that the 12 mayors and the regional chair uh, have been working very closely together with our municipalities, economic development departments, um, because what's good for one area of Niagara is also good in, in my case for Port Colvin. So we are working all very hard. So uh, for those out there that, you know, that are here today that may be closed, you know, we do feel your suffering, uh, but we are here to do whatever we can for you as we move through COVID-19 and as we come out of this. So thank you. Thank you, Bill. Um, Mayor Kevin Gibson, would you care to uh, comment? Absolutely, Vern, and thank you for this uh, excellent forum that we have here today. Um, Wayne Fleet, of course, is unique in that uh, we're like 85% agricultural. 
And so those businesses and their multi-million dollar businesses, they're moving ahead as per normal. Um, the fields are starting to get plowed, dried up and plowed, and they're starting to, <clears throat> excuse me, get things uh, going for the crop. So uh, Niagara Region's bacon and eggs uh, will be there uh, as we move forward without any problems. Um, within the township, but like everybody else, we've deferred penalties and uh, interest on taxes till the end of June. Um, and we've also, we've struck a new committee uh, just the other day, we uh, struck that committee to look at uh, economics of uh, some of our expenditures. And like everybody, we're being very, very careful um, in how we allot our money. Um, there's no roadmap for what's going on right now. And we can look ahead and, and try to guess the best route forward, but nobody knows for sure. So we're being very careful with uh, the township's money and uh, making sure that we, uh, we don't jump the gun and, and spend uh, dollars where we shouldn't be spending our dollars. One of the things is we don't have a lot of big businesses. Um, a lot of them are, are small, two, three, 10 employees sort of thing. So they're generally quick to adapt and uh, you know they were easy and quicker to close down and they'll open up quicker and easier as well because uh, just the nature of being a small business when you only have a few employees, it's, it's really quite simple to move that forward. So um, that's it for us. The one thing I do want to say is I've been really, really impressed um, with the whole region here. Um, for the leadership from the top down, all the mayors, all the regional councillors, everybody is working together. Nobody's out there by themselves trying to figure out what do we do next. And uh, somebody, I'm not sure who it was, alluded to it, but we, you know, the mayors, we meet every Wednesday uh, virtually on the phone and discuss issues and uh, it, it's it's really good so you actually have um the 450,000 people served by the, living in the region are being served by a lot of people who are on top of the game and know what's going on from all the staff at the region staff at the municipalities the mayors and all the councillors. so it's actually really nice to see and uh, it's it's excellent uh, work getting done on this front so I'm uh, very impressed with it. It's really good. So that's about it. Thanks for the thanks for those comments, Mayor Gibson. Much appreciated. Um, um, yeah, and and um, I have to agree with you. I think there's a lot of work being done and proactively as well. And it's uh, we should we should be very proud of you guys and our regional leaders in general. Um, last but not least, and uh, the guy who wins the best shirt contest for the day, we have uh, none other than Mayor Diodotti from Niagara Falls. Oh, you're still muted. muted. One second, you're still muted. That's, That's okay. the best way. Okay, I, I'm back. There nice. we go. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. So first things, uh, thanks. I'm glad you like my shirt. The other guy who I should point out likes my shirt is Sam Oosterhoff. Our MPP is on right now, and, and I just I do want to make mention of the fact, you know, Sam called last week out of the blue. I thought maybe he needed something, and uh, he just said, I'm just, so finally I said, so what can I do? And he just said, I'm just checking in on you. You know, everything okay? Is there anything else we can do for you? He's been great, very responsive. Uh, when I text him or call him, he's been terrific. So I know we've all had that same experience, which is terrific. Um, Wants well, that shirt, Jim. <laughs> well, that was the other part. I didn't want to mention it, but okay. He asked me where I got it because uh, he thought maybe he could grab one too. <laughs> we can go out like the Schmengi brothers, you know. So, um, <laughs> cabbage rolls and coffee. Mm -hmm, good. So, a couple of things. Um, first of all, one of the things that we've done here in Niagara Falls, we've created a real comprehensive FAQ section of our website. Uh, a lot of people are calling, many of them with the same questions. You know, it's the old 80 20 rule. And uh, like uh, it's been said many times, you know, if you can address that, and we have. And anytime we get a question that we think maybe other people want to have an answer to, we put it on the website. So we start like that. So that's our 24 hour uh, way of communicating. And it's been very effective. We've had a lot of compliments on it and, and it's good. And anything that we don't answer there, well, of course, we're answering our phones. We've got a lot of phones call forwarded. And uh, of course, we're an essential service. So a lot of us have to work from home, but we're still working which is terrific. Uh, the other thing I'd mention is we created a buy local business directory on our website as well. 
uh, I had a lot of businesses reach out to me and say, you know, people don't know that we're open. And, and there's a lot that are open that are having curbside service, delivery service, or whatever the case is. So we've, instead of waiting for people to figure it out, we thought, we'll just list them. It's a, a, a way where people can find out who's actually open and uh, how you can get service. Because a lot of people are asking, can I buy plants? Uh, you know, if you see a lot of people are having uh, soil delivered to their front yards, they want, they're at home. They want to do things at home. Mm -hmm. So what can they do at home? So we've created that. And uh, we're encouraging businesses, tell us your hours, tell us how people can um, access uh, your business. And it's uh, another service to the city. Of course, all the economic development departments created the economic rapid response team, uh, where we're working closely with other levels of government to make sure that we get the funding that we need and also to be the voice for them. I mean, they're asking us, what do you need? Like when uh, MPP Usteroff reached out and said, what, what do you need? We have to tell them, just like in business, you go to your customer and say, what do you need? What do you want? What do you like? What can we change? You go to the customer. Well, here we're municipal. We're at the closest level of government to the people. And we get it right between the eyes all the time. And, uh, and I want to say that we're, we're listening. And also, I want to compliment, you know, the idea of all the mayors getting together at the region. You know, there's a, a quote that Plato uh, used, and it's been repeated many times, that necessity is the mother of invention. And when you need it, you'll come up with it. And, the fa and, and even during terrible times, good things come out of it. And this uh, new communication, this Zooming, uh, this idea of all the mayors connecting, it is fantastic. I never felt so close to all the mayors. Uh, and I've never ever, <laughs> I see some smiles there, but it's true. I have a chance to express my style or lack of style. Uh, but regardless, it's a great way to communicate and, and share. And, uh, and I really appreciate it too. I'm gonna tell you, the years I've been doing this job, this is one of the best uh, and closest I've felt to all the mayors. It's been really terrific. Neat. Lots this is the way we like it, Jim. <laughs> we can see you, but we're going close up or down, up or down, down, down. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Jim's shirts are going on sale, by the way, after this uh, webinar. Uh, you can go to his website. You can buy them for twenty-five fifty. All proceeds are going to. We don't know where yet, but. <laughs> People that need help with their uh, fashion. <laughs> like there you me. go. There you go. Um, we'll, 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 we'll move into question number two. And uh, we'll uh, start with Mayor Diodati, actually. And uh, the, the, the question relates to uh, our, our healthcare system in Niagara. And um, as so well said by Mayor Diodati, uh, you guys are the front line. I mean, everybody else is uh, at 5,000 feet to 10,000 feet. You guys are at ground level. Right, you uh, you are with the, the actual community. Nobody else is, um, and, and so our healthcare system, from a local standpoint, is important to look at. Um, needless to say, this is an unprecedented situation. Nobody could have forecasted it. Nobody could have 2020, you know, crystal balled it. Nonetheless, we're into it now, and and the issue here is to look at our healthcare system and say, has it been adequate? Uh, not that we can blame anyone. Uh, do we see changes that, that we'd like to make going forward um, after all this happens? Um, so, so the question is, um, how is our healthcare system working out and uh, uh, what changes would we be recommending um, for, for the future? And, and I'll start with Mayor Diodati. Well, I'll start by saying this is a work in progress for all of us. There's no uh, COVID for dummies yet. Uh, I mean, there's no uh, pandemic manual for us to figure this one out. We're, we're learning on the fly. And uh, this is where all your past life experience comes to play. And you can figure out, and that's one thing about entrepreneurs, like a lot of the people on this call, and I consider myself one of them. I, you know, worked in my own businesses for 25 years. And you just figure out ways to make things happen. You have to, you have no choice but to survive. So question is, could it be better? Of course. Could it be worse? Yes. Could be better and it could be worse. Uh, we're working with what we have. And I guess, you know, I've been doing a lot of studying of what's working around the world and success leaves clues. And you don't have to look that far to see the successes. And a, a great example is Taiwan. Taiwan with 24 million people have had six deaths. And how are they so successful? And South Korea and the Czech Republic. And there's a number of great examples out there. And I'd say what and I've been really consuming copious amounts of data on this. It seems to me it comes down to testing and tracking. 
If you can do that, of course, masks, show social distance, isolating, they're all important. But the countries that are doing the best, they did the most testing and the most tracking. And we have the technology today to do that. And I, we were on our mayor's call earlier today and there's local companies here. One, I'm Mayor Ugolini's backyard, as a matter of fact. The technology exists right here where we can step up and we can help flatten or crush the curve, as we say here. And, and it's going to be through more testing. You know, I, I posed a question last Thursday uh, to our um, uh, acting medical officer of health. And I said, are we following the directive of the premier in testing every employee and every resident of our nursing homes and our long-term care facilities? And he said, we can't. If we did, we'd be two or three weeks of not testing anybody else. And I thought that's kind of frustrating. We're telling people stay at home. And the reason is because we don't have enough testing available. So we need to do more testing. And I'm not pointing the finger at anybody. Uh, what I'm saying is we need to use our, we've got a lot of smart, resourceful people right here. We need to come up and take advantage and allow these businesses to pivot and allow them to help us so that we can do more testing and tracking. So I'll uh, stop right there. Thank you, Jim. Much appreciated. Um, Mayor Gibson, would you care to uh, go next on this one? Yeah, certainly. Uh, a lot of good points there by Jim, uh, as always, uh, well spoken. Um, one of the things that uh, I look to here is uh, the number of experts that are out there that are dealing with this crisis. Um, I mean, your question is based on the current health. Uh, if, is there uh, changes that you think need to be made? Well, of course, uh, I'm not an expert in any form of any health uh, uh, stuff that way. So I always believe let the experts be the experts. And, um, you know, in, in uh, Niagara, we're, we're well looked after, Ontario. And in fact, the, this is a global response by the medical experts of the world. They'll sit and they'll formulate, uh, they'll have meetings when this uh, all settles down. And uh, it'll be looked at in, from many different angles and determined, uh, you know, best practices that were made, uh, poor practices that were made. Uh, if this happens again, what should we do next? Boom, boom, boom. And the roadmap will be created. Um, and so I've always been a, a strong advocate. Let the experts be the experts. Uh, here within Niagara specific, I think we've done a good job. Uh, there has been some, some maybe short shortfalls that some things could have been a little differently, but overall, I think that uh, our, our uh, Niagara Health has done a great job. And uh, our numbers, you know, you look across the, the river, um, it's out of control. And you look here and we are, are doing really well. And so I think that we obviously are doing things right. And uh, of course, there's always things that could be done better and, and uh, but you know, that's to look at afterwards. And uh, truly, um, this will be studied uh, immensely for the next number of years. And uh, they'll come out with uh, a roadmap uh, per se on, the, you know, if it happens again, let's hope it doesn't happen again. But um, that's, that's I really rely on the experts and the people who go to school for years and years and years, to, <coughs> excuse me, years and years to, to learn all that. So, uh, I think it's uh, that's where we have to put our trust is in our experts. So, thank you, Mayor Gibson. Uh, Mayor Steele, would you like to comment? Yeah, thank you again. Um, first of all, I just like to to mention that uh, through our CAO's office, Scott Louie and myself, and Mayor Redekop and his CAO and their staff, uh, Port Coburn and Fort Erie formed a partnership with with regards to healthcare. So we did that uh, back in around uh, December, January. So that's working out very well uh, for both our municipalities. We've, we've seen a, a, um, the same issues that Fort Erie has, Port Coburn has with regards to doctors and um, other medical practitioners. So, so I, I do have to mention that because that is working out uh, very well. And my notes come from that shared person, Joanne Ferricholi. So, uh, so if I say a lot of this, I'm sure Wayne's going to say, oh my God, it's the same notes. But I do, I do appreciate that. And the other thing too, is my wife is an ICU nurse at, uh, at the Welland site. So she is uh, right in the middle of this uh, throughout this whole uh, pandemic. So I do get a lot of information from her and how things have been working. Um, the one thing I do have to say is where we have been really lucky is the fact that our hospitals aren't overwhelmed. Um, you know, we looked at Niagara Falls as being the, the overflow hospital for COVID. 
um, but everything's just been held in St. Catharines uh, so far. So um, that bodes well for our public health and, and, uh, and, and, and health in general here across, not just uh, Niagara, but across Ontario. Um, but just with regards to a few points that Joanne has given me here, under primary care, our healthcare system is robust as we move to enhance primary care. COVID-19 uh, pandemic has shown where there are gaps in care and transition points of care uh, are not what they should be. We recently had four family phys physicians retire in Port Coburn, leaving many residents without a family doctor. Uh, the provincial guidelines for retiring physicians has not made it an easy transition and must be reviewed. Uh, having our primary care providers step forward to offer virtual appointments has kept many people out of the emergency room and urgent care. I did go through that today, as you notice, my eyes are almost swollen shut here with a, some type of allergy. But I did a, a virtual meeting with my doctor this morning and it worked unbelievable. I'd rather do that than have to sit in his waiting room and uh, move forward. So I think moving forward, we got we have to make sure that we let the province know that you know, these are good ideas. And I think it was Jim that said, you know, some good things come out of some bad things. And I think that can be one of them. But under long-term care, our biggest hurdle is long-term care uh, and the long wait lists to get into long-term care in Niagara. Retirement and long-term care homes are struggling to contain COVID-19. Our citizens are at risk because of their age and because of the PSW crisis. For poor Colbert, however, the biggest issue is the folks still in their homes trying to maintain independent uh, independence and staying healthy enough to remain there. We desperately need to ensure our seniors have the supports they need, and this is difficult with the shortage of PSWs and home care personnel. Uh, under the testing issue, I think uh, Jim uh, said uh, most of, it, uh, of what we were going to say, um, but Niagara uh, Health and Public Health in general, Niagara Health and Public Health continue to provide leadership as we navigate the crisis uh, through Dr. Hergy. Centralizing the COVID patients in St. Catharines has worked well, knowing our smaller sites can handle the influx of increased complex care and palliative care patients uh, has helped the system significantly control uh, spread. Um, so that's where we are with that. But again, with Port Coburn losing doctors and our partnership with Fort Erie has, has helped immensely. So um, anytime we can do that, uh, we, we look for those partnerships. There's other things we've done across Niagara, but in the healthcare field, uh, we are moving uh, faster than what we would have been if we hadn't made this partnership. So, thank you. That's great. Um, Mayor Junkin? Yes, thank you. So, I, I guess uh, I'll look at this at a couple of levels. Uh, the first, of course, is at the national level. I, I, I think most Canadians uh, have to be very disappointed in the fact that uh, this uh, virus started out a long way away, and it just seemed like the people that we pay the big bucks to to uh, keep an eye on this uh, kind of pandemic spread. They, they, I think they dropped the ball for, uh, for, can for Canadians. We had three months to prepare and then all of a sudden it's here and then, oh, well, son of a gun, we need this, we need that. Uh, so, I, so I think as, as most Canadians, I'm a little disappointed that we didn't get the supply chains up uh, sooner and maybe we wouldn't be uh, behind the testing ball now maybe uh, people wouldn't be worried about where they're going to get their uh, PPE some from. Uh, it, it just, uh, I, I think nationally, we, we dropped the ball for preparedness. On the local level, uh, of everybody, uh, I, I don't have anyone uh, involved in personally in the healthcare system, but just from the stories you read and, and, and what have you, uh, you've got to give the grassroots people, the people that are carrying out the work, you've got to give them 10 out of 10 uh, be a higher number if you could go. Uh, their, their dedication to the people of the region are, is, is off the charts. I will, however, say that perhaps the, uh, the, the operation of the uh, health care uh, health unit, uh, I, I believe that has in the reporting of positives when they are indeed in the neighborhood. We had uh, um, three people test positive in town office. We weren't very happy how we uh, were notified by the health unit. Uh, we were thinking uh, if we would have got the word a little sooner, uh, I realize there's privacy issues, but it would have uh, calmed our staff down uh, if the reporting procedure had been a little more um, up to date, uh, if, I'll, if I can say that word. Um, other than that, uh, no, I, I, I think... Um, the the the, the, the health unit has uh, done a commendable job, but and they're doing a good job because the citizens 
have, have, have crushed that curve. Uh, we, we realized at the, at the beginning that if we don't stay home, we're going to have over, the hospitals are going to be overwhelmed. And, and thank goodness, uh, but also thank the citizens that that never happened. This, this whole stay at home, whoever put that out there, and, and if that's the health unit, if that's professionals, uh, kudos to them. Because uh, that is what has, when you, when you hear what happened over in Europe uh, and choices had to be made, uh, I don't believe the doctors here in the region or in, perhaps in any place else in Canada, they haven't had to make those, the, those kind of choices because uh, the, the citizens of this region and of the country are, are doing their job, 99% uh, of us. So that was, uh, that was great to see. And by, by the citizens doing their job, uh, the health unit, of course, was able to, uh, to do their job. So other than that, like I say, other than some reporting uh, procedures that I think I'd like to see uh, sharpened up a little bit. It, it was nice to see on the, uh, with the little prodding, prodding from the mayors that we're now getting more information on the, uh, on the Niagara Health uh, website, uh, a little more different uh, statistics are put up there, which are, uh, again, the residents came to us, we took it to the, uh, to the regional staff, and, and, and they're doing a, a better job there now. And so I, again, uh, just like the municipalities have had to be very fluid in this whole uh, pandemic story, uh, the health unit has been there also. And as they have learned, they, uh, they have sharpened up and, and, uh, and, and did what they had to take to be responsive to the people. And, and I thank them for that. Thank you. Thanks, Mayor Junkin. Uh, Mayor Redekop, uh, would, would you care to uh, do an annex to uh, Mayor Steele's uh, comments or? Yeah, I just uh, wanted to say that he, he obviously got better notes than I did. And I thought we were paying Joanne more <laughs> than you are. I don't know how that works. <laughs> so I did get some notes. Um, fortunately, they're a different tenor. But I did want to say that Friday, May the 1st is National Doctors Day. And I think we should all recognize the tremendous effort that the physicians have been putting in across this country. I happen, uh, I happen to have a daughter who's a physician. She's been working in Niagara. And, uh, you know, this is, this is a challenging time for doctors, nurses, uh, anybody who's in the healthcare profession. Um, and it's fortunate that the people who, who live in, in Niagara and in the country are doing their very best to make sure that they protect not only themselves, but those around them, particularly those that they're relying upon to make sure that, uh, they, that we all stay safe. Um, in terms of Niagara, I think Niagara's done very well. Um, I think that it's, a, it's been a challenging situation because we have three organizations that are primarily responsible for various aspects of health uh, care in, in uh, the province and in Niagara. Um, I know that Niagara Health has, has taken a lot of initiative. They've put out a lot of information. They've tried to be transparent. They've been very fortunate in the sense that they haven't experienced the type of um, flow of patients that they thought they might uh, anticipate. And that all has to do with the fact that the population has uh, abided by the directives and has uh, stayed at home, has made sure that they're uh, making uh, their neighbors safe. Public health also has, has, has done well. Um, the uh, Niagara Health System has just recently stepped up to take over some of the burden in the uh, long-term care homes, which has really been necessary uh, because that's a situation that's somewhat out of control. I think that the province could um, provide better direction to our healthcare um, agencies in terms of who's supposed to be doing what and who's supposed to take the lead on various things. And I, I, so I, I'm looking for better coordination going forward. This situation, which as you've mentioned is unprecedented, undoubtedly will be the impetus for that type of thing. Because if we ever come into, into this again, and history says that there will be another uh, epidemic or pandemic down the road, we need to be prepared for it. I would look, I would think that there would be um, an eye to making sure that we've got capacity um, in terms of resources, as Marvin had mentioned, that we've got the ability to scale up quickly if we have to with respect to personal protective equipment. I would think that we'd be looking at capacity to make sure that the hospitals, if they're in need uh, of more space, have the ability to do that. And I think the NHS has done an excellent job. 
They have opened up beds in um, Douglas Memorial and Fort Erie as an example to provide for overflow in other hospitals. Um, so they've done a good job on that, but I think that's gonna be something that will in the future be built into the system. Um, have to look at things like how people are being paid at the lower levels of the healthcare professions. Um, you know, I think it's, this has really highlighted the fact that you can't just warehouse um, people in long-term care facilities and you can't expect them to be warehoused by people who are, aren't necessarily earning uh, good wages for the work that they're doing because it's, it's very important work. I mean, the people that they're caring for are the people that got us to where we are. And, and uh, you know, so the saying is that a society is known by how well it treats uh, its, its seniors, its elders. And I believe this is a situation where that will uh, change. Um, I think we're going to be looking at um, redundancy in the system as well to make sure that as we hit these types of situations, we've got a fallback uh, position. So those are the things that I think we'll be, we'll be needing to keep an eye on and to consider and to possibly implement. The one thing that I will say, and, and I've been thinking about this since, um, since the federal government announced its first large um, financial package and has, has announced subsequent financial packages, um, these are unbelievably large uh, debt that, that uh, the upper levels of government have taken on. And somebody is going to have to pay these uh, bills at some point. And we're not finished, uh, the upper levels of government aren't finished putting money out. So at some point, I think we're all going to have to realize that these expenses are going to have to be paid for and they're going to be paid for by taxes of some sort or another, whether it's changes in income tax, whether it's sales tax, whether it's, I guess they could have been taxing uh, booze um, right now because there's record sales of that. But we have to realize that down the road, that's going to be something we're going to have to pay for. So we're going to have to establish what our priorities are. And if healthcare is near the top of the list, which it should be, there is a cost to that and our society is going to have to tune in. Well said, well said. Um, yeah, thank you, Mayor Redick. Uh, you know, just to, just to pipe in here, uh, you know, treasury issues uh, isn't something we have on our list of questions, but they apply to every level of government tonight. And I'm sure uh, all of you are, are, are looking at your cash flow and, and situations of, uh, of uh, uh, you know, uh, delayed uh, payments and so on and so forth and how that's going to affect your startup and where your cash is going to come from. Thank you so much for that. Um, Mayor Campion, would you care to um, add comment? <clears throat> well, sure, Vern. Uh, you know, a lot has been said, and uh, I agree with all of the comments that have come forward to this point. A couple of things I think are, are, are somewhat important. Uh, just following up on what uh, Mayor Redikoff said, you know, we have to look at capacities. We have to look at availability of inventory. Um, you know, we... We learn from these types of things. You know, we, we made it through SARS, we made it through H1N1 and learned something along the way, but we haven't learned everything. So, you know, from those previous issues, pandemics or whatever you want to call them, there were still gaps in our system. So we didn't maybe take some of these things seriously enough and look at what the real repercussions are and looking what the value is within the healthcare system. So when we look at value, you know, we're now reevaluating how important is a PSW? How important is the care provider in a long-term care home? So, you know, we're seeing that there are gaps there that we need to fix those. And, you know, I, I hate to pay people more money, but in certain circumstances, we have to evaluate how important is that person to the system? And if it's a, you know, it's a very important person, they should be paid accordingly. And I don't think that's the case now, but I think we're moving in that direction. If we want to have enough people, quality people, then we have to pay for that. And, you know, going back to what you said, for, you know, one, one of the things that we all need to do is mitigate these losses, you know, so we can keep printing money and pumping money into the system, but we have to cut costs to get there. And I know uh, most municipalities are doing that type of thing. So when we come out of this, you're, there's going to be a lot of money owed all, all around. But if we can do some mitigation early enough, we will take less, less, put less burden on upper levels of government and our own governments and the 
essentially the bottom line is the taxpayer, while still being able to afford to do things. So we haven't bled the economy dry, we bled the, all of our, our money out of the system. So I think that's a, kind of a, an important way that we have to look at it. What does healthcare really mean? You know, we look at healthcare, we say, oh, you know, just a hospital or it's the NHS, but it's more than that. It's all those people that take care of people, people that go visit people at home and take care of them. And the other part of the capacity, I'm glad I spoke after uh, Mayor Diodati, and uh, is the fact that when we talk about capacity, you know, the mantra has been in the past, well, let's shut down hospitals. Let's not put people in hospital beds. Let's, we need less rooms. Uh, let's, you know, get, get people in and get them out and we're not going to provide uh, as many places for people to stay. And I, I think we want to, re that should be reevaluated. You know, uh, the hospital in uh, the, uh, that the hospital down in Fort Erie, you know, if that building wasn't there, well, where, where are we going to find the capacity? You know, are we going to, we don't want to fall back on, well, let's put them in hotel rooms and let's put them in their homes and try to take care of them there. We really need to have that capacity and the redundancy in the system. So I think when the NHS and when the provincial government looks at the hospital system, they have to look at that part of it. It's not about, all about cutting money back. And, you know, I did have a, a conversation with uh, Sam Booster Huff and some other folks about hospitals. And, you know, I, so I think that's something that we want to keep in mind. And I, I do want to say also that both the federal and provincial governments, and they are very available now, even though everybody is so busy, they answer questions, they get back to you. And so now, as I say, is the time, let's keep talking to these people so that they understand what our needs are in Niagara, what the needs are in Ontario, and what the needs are across Canada, so that we've learned something significant this time around because I'm sure whatever hits us next is gonna be slightly different and we're gonna to have to learn something else, but the better prepared we are now from our experiences, the better off everybody will be in the future. Thank you. Thanks, Mayor Campion. Um, lastly, um, Terry, Ugal Terry uh, Ugalini. Thanks, you care to go? Yeah. Um, this question's focusing on Niagara, but if you look across the province, the same issues are across the province. So. It really has affected everybody uh, across, uh, uh, not just the province, across the country, but I'm, you know, focusing on Ontario. Any shortcomings and gaps? Uh, uh, it's not, I don't think it's a time to look and criticize. It's a, it's a time to look and say, what are the shortcomings and gaps and how can we fix them so they don't happen in the future? And uh, I think that's the positive way to look at it. We can look at uh, long-term care was really exposed in all this. Uh, if you look at the number of cases and the number of fatalities across long-term care, um, we know there's some serious issues and that are going to be addressed, I'm confident, and need to be addressed. And one of the issues that come up was uh, having dedicated staff instead of rotating staff that goes from, uh, from long-term care home to long-term care home. And, uh, and the other issue that was raised was uh, rate of pay. Um, these type of workers need to be paid a fair wage. And I think one thing that's going to come out of this in essential uh, services is that a lot of people uh, aren't being, you know, their wage rate isn't really uh, what it should be for the type of work they're doing. The other issue to me that really got exposed was uh, PPE and our reliance on imports uh, uh, on PPE and uh, any shortages we had and the hard to get availability of product was due that we aren't making it here in Canada. And one of the biggest issues is swabs. Swabs were so hard to get and that's when people talk about expanding testing, I, I agree, we need to do that. But we have to be able to have the kits and the biggest problem with the kits was getting the swabs. So those are issues that we need to address. If we want to do the level of testing that we want to do, then we have to make sure that our supply chain is capable. And hopefully out of this, we'll start to manufacture these, a lot of these uh, products here in Canada. Um, there are, so that, those were issues that come up to me. The other thing, and I've always, I'm a believer, and I've always been a believer that there's two things in this country that we got to sustainably fund. Uh, and that is healthcare and education. And I believe if we make sure that we fund those properly, there's actually cost savings associated with that. Uh, if you look at it, if you, uh, if you look at the way you run healthcare and if you look at education, 
this, you have a workforce that's capable of being employed and actually saves you money down the road. So th to me, those are two issues that when we come out of this, we need to make sure we sustainably fund those areas and we move forward and it will be better off as a, not just as a municipality region, but as a province and as a country. So those are just my inputs on those items. Thank you so much, Mayor. <clears throat> um, we'll move on to our third question. Um, and um, this one, of course, is, is looking into the future. And, and uh, we're asking specifically each mayor to, uh, to see, uh, you know, looking forward to how do they envision our communities and our region rebounding uh, from the current shutdown. Um, loaded question. Um, I'm sure there are a lot of theories in terms of how fast or how slowly uh, this thing's going to uh, develop uh, and uh, rebound. Nevertheless, um, we're looking for your insight and your perspective uh, on, on this uh, particular issue as far as where you see it all going. And uh, we'll start again uh, with um, Mayor uh, Ugolini. Um, uh, uh, Terry, are all yours. You put me on the hot seat again, right? Um, there you go. There you go. <laughs> I think that um, uh, it's going to be a slow and gradual process uh, as laid out by the province and public health. And I think the province is putting a, a, a lot of work into this. They want to do it the right way and working with the uh, health system to make sure we do do it the right way. Um, and uh, Mayor Diodati hit the nail on the head uh, but earlier when he talked about it's going to require um, a widespread testing and follow-up and uh and i really believe that's important uh it you know the statistics show that's where we have to head um and we're still going to have to adhere to the to the uh, principles of social distancing hand washing and all the messaging that we laid out and what i hope doesn't happen is that as we start to open up things people forget about uh the things that got us to where we are so it's going to be uh, finding that balance. Um, we're in a marathon here. This is not a sprint. Uh, it's going to take time. But uh, if you look to the future, uh, hopefully we're going to develop some effective drugs that can fight this virus. And eventually, and hopefully sooner than later, uh, it's going to rely on a safe vaccine that's going to be the key in all this. But that's not going to happen tomorrow. But uh, if you look at a strategy moving, uh, it's gonna be slow and gradual and methodical and uh, we're gonna have to monitor and test and hopefully we don't run into a situation where uh, people get lax and we get a second wave and then we have to shut down things again because that's not good for anyone. Thank you. Mayor Campion. Yes, uh, thank you. So, <laughs> It's, it's a very interesting question in the sense that we have very little control over the answer. Uh, you know, it's, it, it lies with upper level of government as to what they're going to roll out, when they're going to roll it out, how they're going to roll it out. So I think our key information that we need to gather is and understand is what does that look like? So, you know, I agree with Terry, you know, there's going to be rolled out slowly. But when I, when I think of slowly, it's like, it will only open up to certain types of industries over time. And I, I would anticipate, and it could be completely wrong, that one of those might be the construction uh, sector because there is a large demand for housing. It's, it's a thing that's in demand. It's also something that through regulation, they will be able to put in place rules and, and other procedures to make sure that they continue to have the social distancing or wear, are wearing masks when they're supposed to be wearing masks. We had a conversation with a manufacturer yesterday. They're saying, yep, we will be able to open up, but we're gonna to have to be wearing masks in here. So it's gonna be a change in the way they operate. Uh, the construction in industry, we heard yesterday that the new rules dictate that they're going to have to have, that you can't just have a porta potty and you know some hand sanitizer. You actually have to have, probably gonna to have to have a fully functional washroom, which has to hook into electrical systems. And so a lot of these places don't have electricity at this point. So we're working with hydro on those things. So it's a, it's a matter of understanding what are the requirements going to be placed on these businesses when they open up, understand what they are, and then help uh, 
uh, on a couple of levels. We can help by ensuring that we can enforce these things. So if the, you know, we have the abilities probably continuing on through our bylaw offices to make sure that people are complying uh, and we need to be sure that they have a safe workplace, but also a safe place to go uh, as a customer. And I think that's going to be one of the more difficult parts. It's, it's almost going to be exclusively through whatever actions are taken, but also the communications around it. Are people going to be afraid to go to a store? Are people going to be afraid to go to a restaurant? So it's a combination of making sure that all of the pieces are in place and be, are being adhered to, and then ensuring that the community gets it, understands and says, okay, it is now safe to do that. And I think that may be one of the larger challenges that we're, we're going to face. So uh, I won't go on and on, I can talk about this for a long, long time, but uh, you know, it's, it really is partially out of our hands in the sense that the upper levels of government are gonna dictate how it's going to happen. But the part that is in our hands is to make sure that uh, people, both businesses and residents continue to do things the right way. So the social distancing, making sure, you know, the sanitation of cleaning your hands and, and all of those things are going to be a part of the success of the rollout. Because if one of those pieces fails, the whole thing fails. And then we get back, as, as Terry says, back into wave number two, which could be much, much larger. So uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Well said. Thank you, Mayor Campion. Uh, Mayor Redekop. Thanks, Vern. Um, is it okay if I take up some of Mayor Diodati's time? <laughs> he, he said you could have it all. He said you could have the whole thing. So that I, was really I, nice I, of him. I, I neglected yeah. in, in my, in my um, desire to respond to uh, Mayor Steele, I forgot to mention that the doctor that he uh, consulted by telehealth, I presume today, isn't going to be paid until July because the government somehow has a system that isn't going to be uh, paying these physicians who now are required to meet their patients primarily uh, over the phone uh, because there's a problem with coding or whatever. That's just not acceptable, particularly in view of the fact that we're relying on these uh, physicians to provide us with healthcare. Um, the second point that I wanted to make related to that then relates to something that Mayor Campion had said, and that is communications. And I'm um, concerned about the extent of the communication that we're getting out of public health in terms of information. And that information becomes more and more important as we get closer and closer to reopening the economy. Uh, and, and when I'm talking about that information, I'm including something like testing. So that we need to know what the test results are. And I happen to believe that public health has the ability through the legislation to require that they receive the stats with respect to the test results that are coming in to the various uh, entities that are involved in that. Public health has a large role and they have the ability to, to do that. And when Dr. Hooji talks about the context in our communities and, and talks about how testing reflects on that, the people in our communities need to know where they stand with respect to the testing. And they need to know where they stand in terms of how safe is it for them to go out? Because fear will be the one major factor that we'll have to account for. It doesn't matter if the schools in Quebec are going to be open. If the parents aren't going to send their children to the schools, it doesn't mean a thing. It doesn't ma matter if the bars are open in New York State or Georgia. Um, if people aren't going to go because they're concerned, then it doesn't help the economy. So we need to get information out there so that people have the context, so that they can be assured, look, we're doing everything that we can. The data says that this is okay. So we can get back, we can get back to moving towards a normal life or a new normal life. In terms of, uh, and Mayor Diodati can comment on this, in terms of businesses that are involved in tourism and hospitality, I see a long, hard road for them simply because people I don't believe are going to be allowed to gather in large numbers. And that's something that uh, tourism uh, providers and, and, and hotel owners are going to be concerned about. In terms of retail, I would see that that could theoretically open up fairly quickly as long as people take precautions necessary, like maybe wearing masks. Maybe when you go into a store, you'll have to wear a mask in the future. Um, in terms of manufacturing, I think there's going to be a lot of demand. The demand is pent up. And I think that if products can be uh, manufactured and sold uh, or imported, I think that that will be good for, for retail and for, and for jobs. 
Um, in terms of construction, I agree uh, again with Mayor Campion that the municipalities, and I'm sure that we're all doing the same thing, we're processing the planning applications, we're processing the building permits, we just can't release them uh, right now. But as soon as we can, there will be a flood of construction. So the workers will be back there. I'm confident that they'll have restrictions on how many of them can gather. They might even be required to wear masks. I don't know that, but I do know that the government, upper levels of government, when they look at this in context with the healthcare advice that they're receiving, will look at, okay, what are the least risky um, businesses that we can allow to open? Uh, and what are the things that we can do to make sure that they're not risky? And what's the next step and what's the next step? So um, that's how I see that unfolding. I think that there'll be far fewer cash transactions. There'll be a lot more online buying. I think that there will be a lot more people um, trying to escape uh, the GTA to come to areas like Niagara, which will mean there'll be even greater pressure on our housing market. Uh, that'll probably be bad news for people, young people in Niagara now trying to get into the market because I see, the, I see the market being further distorted by that. And um, so I, I, I see that, um, what do I got here? Oh, and people will be working uh, more remotely so that it'll be easier for people to come into Niagara from the GTA because they may only have to go to work once or twice a week. They can, they can do their work from home. So I see that those, those changes will take place. I see this as a gradual um, move forward. But I'm, I'm pretty optimistic about, about things because I, I think people will act responsibly. And so I'm, I'm quite optimistic. And done. Thank you, Mayor. Mayor Bredekop and, and, um, and uh, great, great comments. Thank you so much. I, I, I'd like to write an article on your comments, actually. <laughs> Just give me uh, credit. Mayor Junkin, would, would you? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I'd also like to write an article on Wayne Riddickup's, uh, oh, you mean, do I want to talk? Okay. Uh, yes, of course. So um, uh, how are we going to look going ahead? Uh, it's, it's probably obviously going to be a, a new look, but uh, I'm very optimistic the fact that uh, because other areas on the continent, whether we're talking the southern states, whether we're talking eastern Canada or, or western provinces, they're already opening up. They're, they're going to be, uh, whether they be two weeks ahead of us or three weeks ahead of us. So we'll be able to look and, and observe how those countries, states, provinces are doing and hopefully learn from them uh, uh, going forward. Uh, and, and I think that's going to be a great, uh, a great for our area to be able to observe this uh, from a distance and, and use that for, uh, for the province. Uh, I'm, I'm, again, uh, are, are restaurants going to be opened up and be completely full? No, but if everybody, if we can open these uh, businesses, whether it be restaurants or retail, and, and maybe uh, the retail, maybe that's going to be uh, one thing that's going to be uh, uh, a steadfast uh, look at now is that someone's always going to be have to be at that door to make sure the businesses don't get, maybe that's going to be something that's always going to be there for another uh, four or five months. Uh, and, the, and the same as restaurants. Maybe everyone's going to have to uh, uh, have reservations. You, you just can't go to a restaurant because if you have a reservation, they're going to have your table reserved, give you whatever it is, half an hour, 45 minutes, and somebody else is going to come in there. So I, I think those kind of, uh, uh, I mean, they've always been there, reservations, but I think it'll be used more. I'm actually uh, optimistic that uh, another couple of weeks go by uh, I, I think that we're, we, we, we've got this curve crushed and uh, yes, there's going to be more some rules in effect that we never would have thought had to be there, but it is all about social distancing. Uh, if, um, if you have to wear a mask, uh, if that's what it takes to free up this, uh, this economy, I'm, I'm sure everybody will do that. Uh, we, we, we've stayed home for uh, whether it be four months or I mean four weeks or whatever, surely to goodness, uh, if we were uh, had to go and wear a mask, uh, that's hardly the, uh, a big thing for anybody to have to do. So I, I'm actually quite uh, optimistic that uh, when we do get rolling and get businesses open, yes, there's going to be new rules in effect. But just as uh, this stay at home was a big new rule, uh, people adapted to that. And I'm sure that uh, 
as, uh, as we roll out new, uh, the businesses again and the health units say, okay, this is, uh, we can go that way, but this is what we have to do as a society. Uh, I'm pretty sure that we will, uh, we will, we can adapt. We have to adapt to those rules. And uh, I'm, I'm quite optimistic in uh, that. Uh, is, is it going to be back to normal, normal? No, but uh, I, I think it's, uh, I, I look forward to uh, getting back to a, uh, a, a, at least what I call a livable situation. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, Mayor Junkin. Um, Mayor Steele, would you uh, care to comment? Yes, thanks, Vern. And, um, I mean, I think enough has been said about uh, a lot of the regional stuff and, and what other municipalities are doing. But just with regards to Port Colborne, so we've, we've drafted our own action plan for post-pandemic period. Um, how it's implemented is going to depend on a number of items. Obviously, the length of the pandemic, the adequacy of provincial and federal resources, and how those resources are made accessible to our bu local businesses. Uh, the ability of small businesses to find creative solutions to address immediate cash flow challenges. Because just even in paying water bills and taxes, it, it's tough for, for, we'll look at you know, retail and for, um, you know, being closed, it, it, it is a burden. Um, the ability to retain and recover skilled workforces uh, or workforce, the levels of cooperation, collaboration, and coordination with regards to recovery efforts. Uh, our plan includes creation of an economic recovery task force, which we've done with the region and our, and our fellow municipalities. Uh, we've done outreach and consultation with local businesses here in Port Colbert, and I know other areas of the region have done the same thing. Uh, we're going to review our bylaws and how those bylaws need to be changed to help support recovery and promoting marketing partnerships and education opportunities moving forward. Uh, new events, you know, we canceled Canal Days on Monday night at our council meeting and how new events moving forward and, and, and obviously it's been said here, the numbers of people that can gather uh, once uh, things start to roll open. So, you know, we're not going to have the 10,000 man concert we would normally have on a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday at Canal Days. Um, so what type of events can we run here in Port Colburn to spur on business uh, for our local businesses, restaurants and things like that? So, uh, you know, those things are going to change. Uh, we've begun working with our downtown and Main Street BIAs. Uh, we've had discussions, uh, which are ongoing, on programming and events to support recovery efforts. Uh, some of the proposals include a Taste of Port Colborne, branded Discover Port Colborne event, a welcome back event of sorts to celebrate the resilience of the community and an opportunity to rediscover all the city has to offer, uh, not only here in Port Colborne, but our, our local municipalities. Again, I want to see local tourism build first because you can keep numbers down and then as time moves on, then we can bring, it was said earlier, GTA, stay where you are. <laughs> Don't come down to visit us yet. <laughs> uh, once things open, you know, let us work on our own. Uh, Taste uh, will focus on uh, forms of uh, all forms of businesses and invite the public to eat, drink, savor, experience, indulge, purchase, and partake in all things Park Over. On the tourism side, um, this was going to be a breakout year for Port Colborne on the cruise, uh, uh, Great Lakes cruising industry. That is done for now. Um, and in the, in the emails I receive um, almost on a daily basis through the Marine Chamber of Commerce, which we're a member, is the fact that places like Milwaukee, Duluth, and, and some of the bigger ports, they're closed right now. There's nothing. And, and nobody is really sure how this is going to move forward for us. But you know, although we're still preparing, we're working with the Seaway and, and our um, cruise industry, um, it really was a kick in the head to us with regards to losing that right away as we were uh, coming out of the gate with our, with our facilities here in Port Colbert. Um, so we have initiated a tourism strategic plan, which started prior to this, and, and, and actually it's going to coincide well with, with our recovery efforts here uh, in Port Colbert um, as we move uh, through post-COVID. Uh, the city is exploring opportunities to continue to support our local businesses to succeed in an increasingly digital marketplace. I know that was said earlier uh, by one of the mayors is the fact that more online buying or, or doing more, um, you know, where restaurants where now you just don't show up at the door and I, you know, your time is eight o'clock and you're allowed to stay here until 9.15 and you got to leave because we have another crew coming in. So life is, is changing right before our eyes. Um, so we'll also be working with local, regional, provincial, federal stakeholders 
uh, to advocate for resources for our local businesses, not just in Port Colborne, but, but across the region. Um, the 12 mayors and the chair have been very adamant on this subject with regards to how resources are going to be rolled out and how we can use these to, to better serve our business uh, community, our commercial community, our industrial community. So um, those things will be moving out. But overall, the city of Port Colborne and the Niagara region uh, in general are resilient, uh, will weather the pandemic, and if we pull together, we will emerge stronger than we did uh, than we were before. So, thank you. Thank you, Mayor Steele. Uh, Mayor Gibson. Uh, thank you, Vern. A lot has been covered, and uh, a lot of uh, points there that I was going to speak to. Um, I'm happy to see that all the other mayors are, are very keen to get their businesses going, and and uh, because a lot of the workforce in Waynefleet heads into Pelham and into Welland and into Port Colburn, even Niagara Falls, and uh, supply some of the skilled labor for those communities. So out here, you're you're either a farmer and you're you're producing you know a thousand acres of crop, or a lot of the people, uh, our residents, um, travel and go into the bigger communities to work. So the faster those communities are up and running and businesses are up and going again then uh, that's quicker for all our residents to get back to work as well. So uh, keep up the good work, gentlemen. Um, we would, uh, the province is doing a great job. The region is doing a great job of moving forward here. And um, I think that the rebound is going to be slow. I think it's going to be um, a number of years and this has already been covered. Uh, Wayne spoke to it very well, as did Bill. Everybody has spoken to it well. Um, it's going to be like like you open up some some one level you go from a phase four to a phase three say in, in opening up and then you have to sit and monitor and you have to watch that and see you know is there an increase is there more spread uh if there is then you have to almost go back to phase four if, if phase three is good then you move up to a phase two and then you have to sit and monitor that and and see and then if there's too much uh, spread, then you got to go back to phase three and, and regroup and keep moving forward. I honestly believe this is a one to two year um, event that we're into. Um, I watch a lot of the medical uh, reports coming out and uh, um, the head doctor of the CDC says not if uh, there's a, a second wave, but when. Um, that is very clear in, in a lot of the experts' minds that is something that we have to to pay attention to as we move forward um, we go too far open too quick and then a second wave comes and then that's when it's actually it can be worse than the first wave so we have to to just watch that and, and be very aware uh, I'm, obviously the province has has all that information and they're aware of it and i think they've even come out and said that you know they're pretty sure there's going to be a second wave in the fall so that, that's an important aspect as we move forward. Um, all the points about uh, it being different, absolutely. It's gonna be different for years and years and years here, unless a vaccine comes out and we all get inoculated and it's gone. But um, you know, the restaurant uh, reservations, true story. Standing uh, six feet apart outside the store, waiting your turn to go in, things like that, that's gonna happen. I think that's gonna be for quite a while. And I honestly think the, uh, the vaccine is what we're going to have to rely on uh, as the, uh, the thing that will end this pandemic completely. Uh, and until we get to that point, I think uh, we have to, you know, be very careful, open in stages, test the water, see how things are going and move forward. Um, so, yeah, that's uh, basic. And then pretty much what everybody else has said, uh, I echo those, uh, those thoughts as well. So thank you. Thanks, Mayor Gibson. Um, last and again, uh, not least, and um, we, we have uh, 10 minutes left, everybody. So um, uh, we, we, we get uh, Mayor Diodati with an extra triple bonus here. So uh, Mayor Diodati, uh, the floor is all yours. Thanks, Fern. Uh, maybe I'll start off by, uh, you know, I've had a lot of people ask me, you know, they see, and I'm impressed. We've had over 100 participants in this call. That's huge. Um, so first of all, to all of you that are tuning in, uh, get a life, okay? If you're listening <laughs> to us, you're hurting. No, no, but thank you. Thank you, because we work for you. And um, a lot of people want to know, and I've had been asked many times, the H in Wayne H. Redekop, what it stands for. And I 
told them. I asked uh, Wayne a long time ago, and he sat me down. He looked me square in the eyes, and he said, handsome. <laughs> Stands for handsome. And uh, he walked away, and we've never talked about it since. So I just thought I'd share that with everyone, add a little bit of value. Just, just for the record, it stands for Henry, which was my father's name. <laughs> All right, so now the story I, changes. I use handsome. <laughs> <laughs> so, because he is a handsome mayor. But a uh, few things I do want to mention, and I echo a lot of uh, Mayor Junkin's comments too. You know, let's focus on the recovery. Yes, right now we're in the doom and gloom stage. But we're going to get out of it. There's light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, so it's a long and maybe a windy tunnel, but we're going to get there. And so here in Niagara Falls, I formed the Mayor's Back to Business COVID Recovery Team. So I've got a lot of members of our EOC, and it's a focus on the new normal. Yes, things are going to be different for sure. But we're going to rise above it because we always do. And why? Because we have to. We have no choice. Here in Niagara Falls, after 9-11, the world changed. And everyone said, oh, my gosh, the borders shut down. Everybody was worried. Everything changed. They said, we're done. Tourism's finished because only 5% of Americans have passports. Well, jump ahead. We've had five of the best years we've ever had because now more than half of Americans have got passports. They adapt it and the people will pivot. They will pivot. Just like now e-commerce, people are buying online. This just jumped things ahead that much far further. And it's all about timing and businesses, you know. And so one bright light is Niagara Regional Broadband. It's a locally owned fiber company. So what do we need now? We need bandwidth. We need more fiber so that we can run these online calls, these video conference platforms. Well, we've been working at NRBN on a new video platform. It's called UC1. And it'll be just like what you're seeing now on Zoom. Uh, similar to what they do on Skype, Microsoft, except I'm told it's going to be better and more secure. So let's wait and see. We're beta testing it right now. It's going to launch hopefully in the next couple of weeks. Keep your eye open. And that's a locally owned company with a focus on reinvesting right here in Niagara. And if you were going to wait on the big telcos, they're going to focus where all the customers are, which isn't here. We're focused only on here and reinvesting here in Niagara. That's good news. So we know there'll be a stepped approach. We know that business in the future is going to have to be COVID friendly. And I'm guessing it's going to be like public health, you know, where we've got info dine, where you can check on a restaurant to make sure that they use good public health practices and you can look them up. And in Toronto, any restaurants there, they've got the big sign in the window inspected by public health. So it gives you a level of comfort knowing that they do the things they need to do that so that you're going to be safe. Well, we're going to do the same thing here, both for our employees and for our customers. So, and maybe that's going to be a whole bunch of things. And we're creating COVID-friendly platforms that we're going to use here in our municipal facilities. And I'm sure business is going to do the same thing. So yeah, it's going to involve distancing, more sanitizing, more plexiglass separations. There's going to be a lot more online content. There's going to be a lot of things moving forward, but we're going to get there. Mm -hmm. The other thing I do want to mention, I saw a comment in your mm -hmm. Q&A from uh, Mark Cherney. He was asking about what we're going to do to be uh, business ready for when this is done and when we get out of this. And we are getting out of it. It's going to be a stepped in stage process. And the part I tell people, it's, you know, it's not a light switch. It's not going to be today we're open, tomorrow we're closed. It's going to be more of a dimmer switch. It's going to be gradual and deliberate. And we got to do it with a focus on making sure that we're doing it in a safe way. So what are we doing here in Niagara Falls? Well, we're already having planning meetings. We got a, a, an opinion letter from our lawyers in Toronto, how we can still adhere to the Municipal Act and have public meetings. In today's new reality, it's going to be done in a different way. And so we're doing it through the um, you know, video conference platform that we're doing here right now. And it works. Yeah, there's some bugs and we're going to get through it. But you just have to start and figure your way through. So we are doing it. And what do we got coming? Our new farmer's market and our culture hub, which is a $14 million investment. We've already, uh, we're right now issuing the tender. Uh, we just closed our ten tenders for the roadway work leading up to the new Costco. That's going to be opening up uh, very soon. We're getting that underway. We've got many sewer and water projects already approved. We're moving forward. We need to make sure that, you know, the thing I, the example I use is momentum. If you've ever pushed a car that's been stuck, you know, when you first start, it is so hard to get it going. But once you get it going, you can use a few fingers to keep it going. It's just getting it started. That's the hardest part. So we don't want to grind to a halt. We want to have things in the pipe so that we're ready to go for when we get out of this, we're going to move forward. So folks, yes, there's some scary things and that's okay because if it doesn't kill us, 
It's going to make us stronger. It's time to pivot and be prepared. And that's what we're going to try to do here. So I'll give it back to you, Vern. Great. Well, thank you very much, Mayor Diodati. Um, you know, uh, ju just to wrap things up, um, and, and I'll state my own personal comments, is that, you know, COVID is a very serious and a very complex issue. I mean, you know, we, we've seen article upon article for the last six weeks on COVID, and everyone adds a new level of complexity to it. Given all that, I take a look at the seven municipal leaders in front of us today, and I say thank you very much for your capabilities, uh, your intelligence, uh, your energy, and the effort you've put into it to, to make your community a better one. Um, personally, I'm very proud to have all of you guys representing us, and, and uh, I, I thank you. You've all stepped up to the plate without exception, so thanks a lot. And, um, and you know what, I, I think it speaks for Canadians, doesn't it? Um, this is what Canada is about. And uh, again, I'm so proud to be a Canadian. I can't think of any other country and I can't think of any other region in Canada to be in than the one you guys are leading. So, so again, thanks a lot. Um, and uh, again, the Southern Tier uh, uh, Chambers, uh, as, as well as the, uh, the Thorold Board of Trade, uh, thank, thank you for, for, for participating and putting all this together. As mentioned by Mira Diodati, we had over 100 people listening. And, um, and for this type of an event, that's, uh, th that's a lot of interest. And there are going to be a lot of other people looking and uh, listening to the recording afterwards as well who couldn't make it at this point in time. So again... Thanks a lot for your time and thanks for your continued dedication, everyone. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.